Start on page 208. 208. We will. Believe this one. Oh, yes. Wow. 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 Wow.
Uh, we're in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. The last statement that I had in the study guide last week, I'll read it to you again, and that way we'll just go from that right into the scripture. It's verse 16 in Acts 3 that we're going to be looking at. It is good for us to remember that if God should use us as a vessel of delivery, we should seek to be humble, never heady, or high-minded, keeping the focus on God and not on ourselves. Peter never made reference to himself or to John. The reference was to Jesus Christ. The reference was to that situation. And as Peter is giving his explanation in verse 16 of chapter 3, and his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes. The faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And I always like to tease a little bit and state that this is proof that uh, Peter was a Texan because he referred to the, to the, to the court as y'all. Uh, Peter, in this process, gives witness or testimony to this healing as being an act of faith as being an act of faith, through faith in his name, through faith in the name of Jesus. This is and we need to keep ourselves, uh, our thinking and our practices in line with the word of God. And I've, I've, uh, I've noticed that a, a lot of, a lot of uh, the prayer emphasis and even the preaching emphasis, we don't, we don't hear a lot even spoken in prayers in the name of Jesus. Now we do around here, but uh, I was I was watching a fairly well known uh, minister on the television, and uh, they were praying, but praying for sick. I didn't hear them. I didn't hear them say one time in the name of Jesus. Not one time. Now that could just be coincidence. I'm not. I don't want to be judgmental. That's why I'm not even judging who it is, but. Uh, I like the fact that as Peter is giving this testimony, he uses such strong word pictures. He says he's strong. He has perfect soundness. And, uh, you know, the, the, the real depth of this, in, in, if we go back and we just really analyze it, when he says perfect soundness, he doesn't mean just in his legs. He means body, mind, and spirit. Perfect soundness is completeness. Perfect completeness. And, and that's what he's referring to. Now this healing and the uproar that, fo uh, the uproar that followed upset the temple leaders. Uh, they at this time set about to capture and hold Peter and John and the healed lame man until the next day. And then in the next day, they were actually going to hold a formal inquiry. Now, in verse, or chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, we get into this particular portion of their inquiry. Um, verse 5, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Ananus, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, or by what name, have you done this? Now, I want you to notice, the scriptures here make it very, very, very this was a legal proceeding. This was the Sanhedrin court setting in session, full session. The high priest, uh, everybody, 
the, the governor, everybody was there. Now, we need, to, we need to kind of get this in our thought patterns here. This court was the ultimate authority of all matters of life that pertained to Jewish people. Their word was final. The only time that we see that the Sanhedrin court was somewhat uh, hindered in being the Sanhedrin court is when the Romans came in and the Romans had taken over and the Romans didn't disband the Sanhedrin, they just limited what they could do. The Sanhedrin court could not pronounce a death sentence. And that's why they had to go through all the processes they did to crucify Jesus outside of the Sanhedrin court. The real question on trial here today is about authority. Authority. By what power? By what name? This kind of gives us what the context of why these leaders felt like they need to have this meeting. It really wasn't about whether or not this was a miracle. It really wasn't about that at all. And it wasn't about the uproar that was caused in, in you know, prayer time at the temple that day kind of got uh, disrupted. Because everybody was thrilled to see what had happened, and everybody came together, and, 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 and every, everybody wanted to And 5,000 people said, oh, we believe in Jesus. And so what the court was afraid of was that this preaching in, uh, in the name of Jesus and by the authority of the name of Jesus was going to strip them of some of their authority and strip them of some of their attention. Isn't it ironic that... The, well, that's, that's... I mean, that goes even deeper into the thing. They, they, they didn't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. And they were participants, these same people were participants in the crucifixion of Jesus. And so now they're saying, well, wait a minute, we thought we had this handled, and it's not handled, and here we are, our way of life is being threatened. But what they really meant was our authority is being challenged. And it's kind of a tedious place because there stood the lame man right in front of them. And the scripture already said he was known. Mm -hmm. And so it's there. Notice here that there's some things that just never seem to change as time goes by. Ruling powers spend a great deal of time and effort to maintain their authority, their power, their rule. And much of the, of the debate and the argument and, and the difficulty that's gone on over the, over, the, over the last four or five or six years in America, it's all of this, all of this division and all this fighting and all these accusations, it's all been because one group's trying to hold its power and the other group's trying to hold its power and we the people are caught in the middle. Because if you believe for a minute just because you're a Democrat or a Republican that you're a part of the problem, you, you need to re-examine it. We have, we have flaws in our system. It's a good system. It's a great system. But there are flaws in it. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest flaws is we allow these men and women to remain in powers or positions of authority far, far too long. They, they, they become like the same. I mean, this is a perfect reflection of what's going on. And uh, with all, I mean, here, here, here we are, we're, we're, we're maneuvering already for the next presidential election, but it's, it, it's, it's not really about electing the president, it's about which party's going to hold the power and the uh, brought forward and, 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 and things like that. And, 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 and now it's, it's, it's even become more of a, of a global issue. But that's what this Sanhedrin report was up to here. Uh, these rulers were focused more on themselves 
And they were on the miracle of God. Uh, they weren't rejoicing because a notable event had taken place in their temple on their watch. They felt threatened. Who is the only one that sh should feel threatened when the miracles of God take place? Yeah, Satan himself. We as believers should never be threatened because God heals somebody we love or somebody we know or, or just hear about somebody. Uh, it, it's, you know, from, from time to time we'll have a, 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 a special testimony that will come across. Uh, sometimes I get them on email, sometimes I get them on Facebook, but you, you hear of a, of, a, of a real miracle that took place and somebody was healed and somebody was delivered and somebody was set free. And I get just ex not just as excited, but almost as excited when I hear about it happening in Tanzania as I do when I hear it happening in Tolar, Texas. Yeah. Now, I can't tell you that I don't get more excited when it's at home because I do. But I think that's natural because we're, we're that, and I, I believe that that's one reason that I'm so excited about tomorrow is because this is going to be something that's close to home. This is going to be something that we've all made an investment in. And actually, when you get right down to it, for the most part, this whole church, we've been together most of our lives. And so we're going to be, we're, 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 we all have an investment in this, in this special blessing. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a scripture that tells us that we should mind the things of others as much as we mind our own things. And, and, the, and that pray, pray for a blessing. For the, for the majority of my life, I have spent a lot more time praying that God bless you, God in eternity, God use your way, than I have for my life. And in that process, we're, no, we're not, we're not supposed to forget praying for ourselves. We're not supposed to leave that out. The, the Bible doesn't teach us that anyway. But I, I've always encouraged people to don't just get it in your little circle. Just don't stay in your little circle when you're praying. Don't just pray about what's bugging you. Don't just pray about what's uh, on your mind or, or what's happening to your family. You, you pray for outside that circle. And I can tell you from experience that if you invest enough time, earnestly invest enough of your spirit into the praying for others, God has a way of taking care of your problems for you. Without even asking sometimes. Sometimes without even asking. And uh, now verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined for the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, uh, and then he goes in the next verse, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop for a minute. I want to touch on something here. The Word of God specifically tells us He was Spirit-filled. Filled with the Spirit. That's when He speaks in the defense before this court. We don't, we, 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 we don't, we should emphasize being filled with the Spirit every day of our life. We should, we should seek that intimacy with God, that closeness with the Lord, that He may have a totally yielded vessel. Totally yielded. Totally full. You know, some, sometimes I find, I find that if I'm not careful, I get so wrapped up in what's right before my eyes or what's hurting my heart or hurting my head that I, I'll, I'll lose that desire and I don't mean lost permanently but I just get a little out of focus but when I seek the Lord first for His will to be done in the day and His will to be done in my life and to be full not just almost full, but full to the overflowing. 
with Him. The Holy Ghost is God who wants to live in us. But we, for whatever reasons, we, because we have free will, we limit how much we allow the Holy Spirit in us. We limit that. We limit that by our doctrines. We limit that by our religious practices. We limit that by our attitudes. We, many times we limit how much of God we have in us, in the Holy Spirit, by our interpretation of things. You know, sometimes we can look at something and we think we understand it, only to find out, oh, I didn't understand that at all. But I, I went a direction, or I made a statement, or I stood my ground based on my interpretation of a situation, only to find out that uh, my interpretation wasn't anybody's but mine. Self-fulfilling prophecy, or you know, one of those things that I'm talking about. Notice that Peter, in his defense, calls what happened on that day a good deed. I want, to, I want to make a link here in your mind and in your thinking. Deeds are works. He's saying this was a good work for the kingdom of God. It was a good work. We need to understand that our works do not save us. And our works do not give us status before God either. Our works are supposed to be the evidence of God in us. They're supposed to be the evidence. Not evidence to us, but evidence to the unbeliever first. And then encouragement to the other believers. So important we you know he said, he said this man was, again, a, he was made whole, complete. He didn't have everything he needed prior to the name of Jesus being revealed to him. I, I can't help but go back in my mind and think this through, that Peter didn't, he, he didn't even ask him if he wanted to be healed. He didn't even ask him if he knew there was such a thing as healing. In verse 9, Peter doesn't have faith for the healing of Jesus. No. He said that the good deed does is to end up in hell. Yeah. He, he, he didn't acknowledge that he was going to be healed. He didn't take any glory for himself at all. This is, this is where, you know, our opening statement, but we, we need to remain, just because God uses us to deliver a healing to someone, that doesn't mean we're anybody or any better or any different. We're just a pot, a bucket, a vessel. And as you remember back to the time when we took time of studying on the vessels, when, when God uses a, a vessel, it's a vessel of honor. It's a sanctified vessel, a set-apart set vessel that God uses to deliver something. And it was here. Verse 10, Peter says, Be it known to you all, there he is at text again, yeah. and to all the people of Israel, know this, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, who God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the second verse that Peter touches again. That makes it more important to us. This man has been made whole. It's more than just a touch, an emotional touch. I'm glad for emotional touches. Over the past few weeks and months, I, I have needed emotional touches very often, and God has been gracious to give them. But, brother and sister, He's telling us twice here, this man is whole, complete, finished, perfect, if you please. Now let's don't get into the debate argument about what perfection is or isn't, because I don't think I know, and I'm not sure that any of us would. But 
But God uses those words, and you know, folks, we need to be careful not to change the meanings of words just to fit our society or our custom or our times. I believe that every word that God put in his Bible is there for a reason. Right where it is. Just as it is. And as we spend all this time looking back at the old original languages and trying to work on these uh, uh, these translations and all these different things, we, we, we find some things that we maybe didn't know or we didn't understand. But we need to be careful not to allow that to change the meaning of the way the word was used. You know, it was, if something was a sin in the old covenant, it's a sin in the new covenant. It doesn't matter how we change the words or we change the meanings of society. Fornication is still a sin. Adultery is still a sin. Lying is still a sin. Healing is still a sin. It just goes on. But look at the way. Peter didn't leave any questions unanswered about where he stood in his faith. Remember, he's defending himself before a legal court. And he's saying, not just any Jesus, because there were a lot of people around named Jesus in those days. He said, Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, by the way, he's the same one you crucified. But he didn't stay dead. God raised him. <laughs> With a two before. I mean, that's, that, he was simply asking for, but he didn't leave out any detail so that there could be a question or a misinterpretation of what he was saying. And then give a point. I was visiting with an individual recently, and they just come right out and said, Brother Bill is blah, 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 sin. And I, I said, why are you asking me if this is sin or not? What does the Word of God say about this? Well, uh, I don't know. And so I shared one scripture. I shared a second scripture. I heard a third scripture, and I said, now, do you still need to ask me this question? No, Brother Bill, I don't. I said, what I'm interested in is why you would trust me to tell you whether something is or isn't sin before you went and looked at what the scripture said. Well, I trust you, Brother Bill. I, I said, and I'm glad you do. I'm glad you trust me. But I'm not the authority in these matters. The Word of God is the authority. She said, well, every time you've ever preached something and I looked it up, it was just the way you said it was. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. And I said, I, I said, Probably the reason you didn't look this up is because down in your soul you already knew it was sin. And you already knew you were guilty of it, but you're not willing to repent. So you were hoping that somewhere along the line I'd have some variable or I'd have some other interpretation that could ease your conscience. Maybe they were hoping that I'd change my mind. I'm always taught if you have to ask if it is, it is. Because if it, you wouldn't have to ask if it wasn't. You know it was. No, if you're asking, you it is. That's <laughs> right. Absolutely. Now, uh, he didn't stop there. Let's go on to verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. That's a 
good old Pentecostal preacher right there. And I've used this, quoted this, shared this, never needed to modify. It's the name of Jesus. It's all about the name of Jesus. Peter doesn't take any credit whatsoever for this miracle. Even though it was him, it was Peter, by his choice to initiate the miracle of this man. And I was just going to say, he also doesn't beat the bush when he's telling him that even knowing it could come back on him. Absolutely. He still stated the truth. He, he wasn't so much worried about what sentence they might have. Exactly. Right. I believe that him and the way he presents stuff before the court is is a lot has a lot to do with his upbringing, the way he was raised, the way he was trained. He knew exactly how to present it. Well, you know, Peter was raised as a Jewish man. He knew the same training. And by the way, the exact same training that Peter received, Jesus himself received. Yes, yes. And their culture was a culture of stating their defense openly. Notice that this, this court didn't have the doors closed. There were a lot of other people in that courtroom, in that setting. It was a very, very public setting. And Peter was confident that he could say what he said. The point that I wanted to try and get a hold of is, I meet so many Christians today that will not speak up for Jesus unless the other person initiates the thought. You know, we're told everywhere we go, don't talk about religion or politics. Well, excuse me, I'm going to talk about what needs to be talked about no matter what the setting is. And one of the reasons that we have all this mess we have in Washington, D.C. is too many people have been quiet about their Christianity and too many people have been quiet about their politics. We need to call a snake a snake. We need to reveal what's going on. What's Peter's doing here? He went to that lady and silver and gold, I don't have any, but such as I have, brother, he didn't ask him if he wanted it. He didn't ask him if he was interested. Can I have a moment here to have you talk to you about Jesus? <laughs> Come on, folks. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we see a need. We see the need, not just through the eyes of our human understanding, but we see it through the eyes of God. And when we know that God and his power and his authority is available to us, all Peter had to do for this man to be healed was speak the name of Jesus and reach out, take him by the hand, lift him up. That's all he had to do. Yeah, but look at all the trouble that got him into. Peter didn't care about this. When you're so worried about what's going to happen when you do something, the focus isn't on God, it's on you. Me, 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 me. Well, what are people going to think of me if I talk to them about Jesus? If you care so much about what people think about you, maybe there's something missing in your experience. Maybe you've got a part of your heart or your mind or your soul that you haven't turned over to God. Oh, I'm not supposed to be preaching tonight. I'm supposed to be a teacher. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. Yes. That's what society says our Christian today fears is allowing the Holy Ghost to use them. I don't I don't find the word I I don't find a reference. Right. I don't find a reference in the in the word where Peter regretted. 
being used of God for this man to be healed. I don't see that he has a word here of complaint about being held in jail overnight. You, you, you're walking on my rights. You're not treating me fair. Brothers and sisters, we need to quit looking for fair. The only time we're going to live in a place where it's all fair is when we're in heaven and it's over. As long as we're walking down here, Satan is going to see to it that as little in your life as possible is fair and right, and especially righteous. You know, uh, Peter, he said, look, this Jesus is the one you crucified God raised up. See, he's relating the events of the crucifixion and bringing it up to them and reminding them. Yeah. You, dear Sanhedrin court, you are the ones that placed Jesus in that place, and you are the ones that did it. And then he reminds them, remember all of these people that are sitting in this court situation, they're all Jewish, and they all know and understand everything that the prophets have ever taught about the Messiah coming. And Peter is standing there before them, reminding them of their own culture, their own heritage, their own religion, their own faith. Of course, now, go ahead. I think a little bit, though, I think the night Jesus was reminded that I was a Savior. I think that personally, Jesus got in Peter's mind and he wants to fail him again. So I think a little bit of Peter's boldness here is that he wasn't going to personally do that again. He was going to make sure he spoke well, what's, to what's and what's but what's the difference between Peter, the Holy the, Spirit, and the Holy Ghost, the, the Peter before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit denied even knowing Christ, the yeah. Peter after the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost stands up before the highest court in the land and doesn't mince words and he doesn't back down. Yeah. He defends his Jesus. He defends the the name of Jesus and the authority of his name. And he even testifies, here is living, walking, breathing proof that Jesus is the Messiah. And just look at the comparison of the two. The not even I don't even know him. I don't know who you're talking about. Three times before the sun came up. And this time, he's like, not only is it is the one that you crucified, the one that was the cornerstone, but just look at the difference in the same person. It is. It's the same person. It's because the Holy Ghost, the baptism, is God in us. God in us. It's not some religious exercise This just uh, happens in Pentecostal circles. It is literally God himself residing in us because we have invited him and yielded ourselves and we have welcomed him and we... And we... Commune. And we fellowship and we enjoy that oneness with God. Yes. I, 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 I didn't understand. I had no understanding at all of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the night that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I did. I, I just knew that the people that had loved me into salvation had Show me the way, and I wanted anything that this God had for me. And then get it is. But you know what? My life has not been the same since. It was a completely different boy that walked out of that church after that. Just like this Peter that's standing here before, he's a completely different Peter than the one that denied him before the crucifixion. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know, it was the Holy Spirit who was speaking through Peter. It was the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, we need to remember that the power of the spoken word 
You're always going to have to do it. That's why we can't be quiet. That's why we need to speak up. When we, okay? Yep, and life flow through the tongue. We are, we are the vessels that God uses. And, and when we tell people that God loves them, we have to, we need to also tell them that the, the God that loves you more than you even know what love is, but can understand what love, that same God hates sin. He, he, he hates it. It's an affront to him. Verse 14, and beholding the man who was healed standing with him, they could say nothing against him. <laughs> You see, the court, the court was having to witness the evidence that was standing right there in their midst. And I want to remind you now, this fella had been laying out there outside that beautiful gate for a long, long time. And I'm sure that every single one of these officers of the court had seen this same man laying out there begging. So not only was it an official standing before the court as evidence, in their own mind and in their own heart they knew. Some greater power and authority than what we've ever known is involved here. Because we've never, we've never been able to give our people or our, our land. I mean, we're under Roman rule right now. We, our, our authority is jeopardizing in every direction we look. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Yeah. <laughs> but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten it. That they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Yeah, I was going to spread like you do. Verse 4, they say, Howbeit, many of them returned to the Lord's believing, and a number of them were about 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell one person something, and 5,000 will know it in an hour. Especially if someone Facebook. <laughs> we literally can get the word to millions yes. in a matter of seconds because of things like Facebook. And that is, it is. And it's a tool and it's a method for us to use in the spreading of the gospel. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Note here that they didn't hold this conversation about what they were going to do in open court. They 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 withdraw. They went into executive council, <laughs> executive session. <laughs> they knew their goose had been good. So they go aside, but even in their even in their closed door session. They admitted to themselves openly that it was a miracle. And they admitted that it had spread all through Jerusalem already. So they thought, hey, here's what we'll do. Let's redirect the issue away from the miracle. And get it back on our side of the street, back under our authority, and, and let's go out there and exercise it, and let's command them. Let's give them a dictate, an executive order. We're going to sign this executive order. Uh, just like saying, we'll teach them, we'll crucify Jesus, and we'll bring them up, we'll die down, and we'll bring you out. So the court ruling was to remove the name of Jesus from the environment. Huh. 
kind of like taking prayer out of public schools or pulling down the Ten Commandments at the courthouse. See, Satan's tactics never change, church. They never change. No matter what anybody tells you, Satan's powers are limited. He can only go this far. He even admitted it. Remember the story of Job? God, so why shouldn't he pray? You've got a head to build right. I, yeah. Satan was limited in how close he could get to the joke. I remember when Greg Morgan was retired in high school. First thing he did was on the what was supposed to be saved because they never had a program there. On the back wall, he was just walking in the center of my life. Huge letters that said, In God we trust. Mm -hmm. But somebody said, You can't do that. He said, It's on our money. If Monica was on our money, it would be on the wall. And as long as our principal, that was a bold thing he did. And very much so. Very much so. And nobody argued with him. And, and had it been challenged in court, had it been challenged in court, because you know, many places and many, many cases have come up where things were challenged in court. Just like the football coach, you know. The Supreme Court just ruled recently, and the Supreme Court was ruled that that coach had the right to go out there and pray with his players after the game was over, and the school had no authority, and the state had no authority to stop him from doing it. He didn't require them. He didn't require them. That's what we do. That's what Christians do, is we decide, okay, well, I can't do that. Well, we Put that on your car, drive accordingly. 
But I think I, I think the church has been silent far too long. Far too long. You know, I've had I've had people from this community actually ask me, hey, is is so and so all right? Is there something wrong with so and so? Well, why do you ask? Well, I went by the church Sunday morning and that problem wasn't there. In a small community like this, people will see that your car is in the parking lot of the church. And they'll note that. And they'll note, they'll see these things. I'm glad that Peter was an eyewitness to the things that he was an eyewitness to. But I'm reminded that I've been an eyewitness to a lot of great things as well. So I have a story to tell. So, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. Because of the people, for all men glorify God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was shown. Remember, Kathy, you want to know about his age? Well, there we find it. It's right there in the word for him. I just went far along. Now, here's my, here's my closing statements. We're a little over time, I understand that, but empty threats don't work on spirit-filled people. Write that into your Bible. Threats don't work on empty threats, don't work on spirit-filled people. The court didn't administer any physical punishment to Peter and John. They just threatened them. And you know, for the most part, that's all he really does with us. He just threatens us. The people are not going to like you if you if you if you stand out and if you keep telling them about Jesus. I I I have a few friends in this world that when they first got to know me they didn't like me at all. And it was because I was talking to them about Jesus. I was talking to them about sin. I talked to them about salvation. But you know I, I guess I wore them down because I just kept out here and kept on going and kept on going. And now they're my friends. You know, 40 years is a long time for that guy to be in the situation he's in. Mm -hmm. A long time. But I'm glad that I can tell you the length of the battle had nothing to do with the outcome. <laughs> you may be going through a lot of long battles. <laughs> you might be going through a, a, a long, long, long battle, but God is still God. And God is still a healer. And God's name is how we claim our victory for our healing. Amen? Amen. While we're waiting for our miracle, we just need to keep believing. Yes. Keep asking. Yes. Focus on the desired victory. And speak up for Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. Well, we got a few more verses in tonight. Amen. God bless.